Hey everyone, I'm Bardo, founder and creative director of House of Nyabingi, and welcome to Rap and Chat, your moment in the month where the creative culture meets for conversation, preferably with a glass of Caribbean spiced rum and a dash of pims and a healthy side of fried plantain. To get more updates on when the next Rap and Chat will be out, don't forget to click subscribe and leave your comments for us below. Our guest this month is the most wonderful brand strategist, Taiwo Makoma. Taiwo, welcome. Thank you, Padre. Thank you. Many thanks for having me. You're most welcome. It's really good to have you here. And for those of you listening, we've had a few technical issues. Uh, I have a new iMac and we've had um, just issues trying to get this recording sorted, but Taiwo has been most patient. So we're now going to get into this and we're going to have some fun with his responses and just find out how he became a brand strategist and how that can help you get into the industry. So we're going to start off Taiwo with um, a quick second. So it's a quick fire, one minute round. And this is where I'm going to ask you some very, very quick questions. And you've got to answer with your first response. And these are quick fire. So you've got to be ready. You've got to be ready. Your life depends on it. Three, two, one. Favorite genre of music? Jazz. Jazz. Okay. Favorite song or jazz song? Oh my goodness. I have so many. I have so many jazz songs. Okay. My favorite song will be from, um, oh my God, I have too many. I'm more of a smooth, kind of like smooth jazz song. So I do a combination of different artists, R&B artists. Okay. So they have the kind of jazz instrumentals okay. that I deal with. Um, so that's what I do like. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, what would be your favorite aftershave or perfume? I'm a big fan of woody smell. So um, I like to go with woody. And I've over the years, I've selected some a combination of um, fragrances that I've always been wearing and everyone always talks about it. Okay. Um, I do have RMS, Derry Day RMS, uh, Tom Ford, uh, Tobacco Vanelli. Okay. And um, yes, and I do have another range of, um, um, another Tom Ford range, which is another private range as well. It's called the um, Oudwood. Uh, see now, ouds are very, very popular. Very, very popular. Yes. So, it's um, become really popular over the years, yeah. especially with the Middle East opening their market. Yeah. So a lot of brands now have decided to go into making wood uh, fragrances with oud, um, mm -hmm. just to not just to play, you know, applause the, the 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 that market, that Middle Eastern market, but just to also show what they have, which is great. Okay. Thank you. Now, that's actually taken us over a minute, but there's one question I'm actually <laughs> going to ask you. Favourite cartoon character? Tom and Jerry. Do you know, I wasn't expecting you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll let you have that one. Okay. To get more updates on when the next Rap and Chat will be out, don't forget to click subscribe and leave your comments for us below. So, let us start with your childhood. What is your African diaspora heritage and where did you grow up? So could you please tell us um, that? That would be great to hear. Sure. Um, my heritage is Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, my parents, my father's from the Yoruba tribe. My mother's from the Igbo tribe. Whoa. I grew up... Oh, part that's a combination. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and they met in London and... Um, they got married and I, we moved, I was born abroad. I was born abroad and uh, we moved back to Nigeria okay. and I lived in Nigeria for a while and I've lived in New York and London. So you're quite an international man, shall we say? Yes, I am. <laughs> um, which part of um, New York did you live? Which borough? We, we stayed in the Bronx for a while and okay. afterwards we lived in Brooklyn then, but presently my family lives in New Jersey. It's a small town called Bayonne. I know when we were speaking earlier, you mentioned about your mother, which I think is the next question. Who, well, I know it's going to be, you're going to say your mum, is your greatest inspiration growing up, family member or other? So many of my other interviewees have mentioned grandmas. Grandmas have been very, very popular. But I know you mentioned earlier about your mother, so please tell us about her inspiration. Absolutely. My mother has been my inspiration. Um, uh, growing up as a child, my mom, my mom is a very classy woman and she's always 
when she dresses up to functions, to, to events, um, she always looks great. But this particular day, I said to my mom, oh, I don't like your shoes, the color of your shoes with the outfit you have on. If you change it to something else, you might look a lot better. And so she did change the shoes. And when she, when she after changing the shoes, she looked at the mirror, she looked at herself and she said, oh my goodness, you're right. And this looks so beautiful. Her, the pleasure that she got, that happiness, she was so happy that she looked so great. For me, that was what I got from it. For me, seeing her being happy, that was my satisfaction. And since that day, she's always called me up every time she dresses to say, how do I look, Taiwo? Do I look great? Before she walks out. Till today. So how old? Thank you for sharing that with us. I'd like to ask, how, can you remember how old you were when that um, memory happened? I was probably about nine years of age. Oh, so that's quite young. So did you know from then that you wanted to move into like clothing or anything like that? Or was it just a case of because of the bond between you and your mom, there was very much that trust there in, in essence, you were styling her? <laughs> I, I think just to see how happy she was mm -hmm. and how um, happy, how, you know, how she could express herself looking great made me happy. And, and for me personally, that's why I wanted to go into fashion. I was like, you know what? This is my calling. I want to make people happy. And you could make you could make people happy through, you know, their outfit, through their styling, through their clothing, you know, that um, expression of looking good, that confidence my mom had looking great gave me that satisfaction that this is a business that I really want to get into. Okay. And just out of curiosity, um, do you have siblings or is it um, are you an only child? Um... Oh, I, I have uh, I have uh, three brothers and two sisters. I'm a twin. No. Yeah, I'm a twin. There's more than and one. And the for, for us, in Nigeria, once you find, you, you, you meet anyone called Taiwo, yeah. you know automatically the yeah. person is a twin. Yes. I see, I see. Now I've learned something. Okay. <laughs> so, can I ask you, can you tell me, so you've already mentioned your mum, two more influential people in your life when you were growing up and how they impacted you to who, the person you are now. Growing up as a kid, um, we didn't have many black people on TV. Okay. Um, I remember watching TV and watching um, The Jeffersons. Yes. Of Good Times and yes. seeing, you know, Esther of um, Good Times with the Afro hair and. I was amazed on how they looked mm. and seeing people that looked like me on TV um, and expressing their blackness on TV made me feel very important about myself. That's really powerful. Yeah. And it comes back to what we still say to this day, representation matters. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think with, with, with those TV series, The Jeffersons or Good Times, for me, it, it's a story they, they, they told, the story of hard work, the, to the story of um, of how the togetherness of family. This one might make you laugh. What's an insult you've received that you're proud of because it made you laugh, but it was also so incorrect about you as a person and your character? When I was at school, yeah. A teacher said to me, um, okay, um, my mother, she worked so hard and she lived, her job was, I mean, almost 10 miles away uh, from, from home. And so she had to drive us all the way to school. Um, sometimes she has to go into the office, sign and drive us to, drive us to school. Mm. So I was always running... I won't say late, but I was always maybe five minutes late or something. Uh -huh. And so every time I came to class, I go into the classroom, I apologize to the teacher. Now the teacher said something to me. He said to me, 
you know what? With the way you will, you continue like this, you will never achieve anything in life. You know, you're always late and you're always apologizing. And I looked at her to her face. I smiled and I looked her to her face. I said, you're wrong. That what she said that you will never achieve anything. Mm. I was like, I'm going to tell this lady you're wrong and I will achieve something. Yeah. You know, and th- now this is 20 years after she came on Facebook and she found me and um, she, we became friends and when she saw what I do today, she said to me, wow, I am very proud of you. Okay. And I said, I said, I know you will be. There you go. Yeah. I've always turned a negative word to a positive. What I've always d- learned in life is whenever people tell me I can't do something, I tell them I can do it and I will do it. Yeah. I have, uh, I have a cousin. She she lives and works out in, in the Middle East. And if you tell her she can't do something, her key word is bet. She, she just shouts <laughs> bet. And then she just operates by self and she does what she needs to do. And then when you next see her or when she shows up, she's done what you said she couldn't do and then more, you know? And it's one of the most beautiful things I love about her because she very much, I remember writing it down in my journal. She is the cousin, more than any of my other cousins, she truly operates by stealth. She goes into stealth mode if you tell her she can't do something. Yeah. And I love that about her. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. It's, I think it's very, it's very important that we need to um, believe in ourselves mm. and believe in what we do. Um, that belief, as a brand specialist, I, I, I talk more on personal branding, and um, I talk about what you want to achieve today, on five years from now, in ten years from now. Yeah. What are you doing today to achieve that? Yeah. And so it's very important that in achieving anything or setting goals, you need to believe in yourself first. To get more updates on when the next Rap and Chat will be out, don't forget to click subscribe and leave your comments for us below. Your personal evolution, those stepping stones, what were the stones? Um, could be, you could tell me over like three, four steps. What were those stones those steps, sorry, should I say, that took you into the creative world? Um, I didn't get into the creative world straight away. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I, I actually studied law and I work in the copper world. Um, but that wasn't what I wanted to do. I've always been, again, my childhood came in. And so I think the first step has to do with passion. You have to be very passionate about what you want to do in life. Um, And that passion took me back into this creative industry, Mm -hmm. into the fashion industry. Um, Being from an African origin, uh, my father wanted us to, he he had already set aside career path that he wanted us to follow. And so I studied law. I'm a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Um, um, And I went into the corporate world to work. Mm-hmm. Um, the job was good, the money was good, but that wasn't who I am. And so <clears throat> I needed to make those changes, right. but I didn't know how to start. I didn't know where to go. Um, I didn't know anyone in the fashion industry, to be honest with you. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know who to meet. I didn't know who to network with. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but that passion is, was always there. And even while I was working at the bank, I was always each year for the the, the last five years I worked at the bank, I was always given the um, award of best dressed male um, every year. I, I got <laughs> you know every time, and I knew. And each time, I was always each at the end of the year, you know my directors came up to me and said, you know what, everyone, we had this ballad and everyone said, they voted that you're the best dressed male 
for me first being a black person yeah um my identity was actually recognized for me mm-hmm. that's number one mm-hmm. number two being someone who is very passionate about style mm-hmm. and making people feel great you know that made me happy it made me realize that you know what people recognize who i am you know they recognize my identity yeah um, and so i that gave me that push to just you know get into this creative business get into this fashion business mm-hmm. but again they know where to start yeah so number one the passion was there secondly i went to the a course um a, a business meeting to be honest um in malaysia in asia malaysia mm-hmm. and um <laughs> Well, I'm about to tell you it's funny. I stepped out the I stepped out the building, the office building. I was walking back to my hotel. Yeah. A, a gentleman stopped me and he asked me if I lived in Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur. Okay. And I looked at him. I was like, "What's he talking about? Who is he?" And I said, "No, I don't." He said, "Oh, I really like your skin tone." I was taken aback with that and I said, "Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir." And he said, "Oh, I'm a photographer and this is my card." And I took his card and I said, "Thank you." Um in all honesty, I totally forgot about it. I put the card in my pocket and forgot about him. Cuz I was I was there for a program. Yeah. Afterwards, 2 days after, I flew back to London. Yeah. I flew back to London and you know when you have your bags and your things you're trying to to get everything out and you know and do some washing and take your clothes to the dry cleaners I checked the pocket of one of my suits where that uh, card was yeah. and I found his card yeah. and I said oh oh him I said you know what let me go check this guy out cuz he seems like cuz he he was a young gentleman but he was like I'm a photographer uh blah 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 but he told me I can go and check him out on Facebook on and on Instagram and he also has a website. And so I went on to Facebook first of all and I saw what he did and I was like oh wow. And I saw the people the clientele he had and I was like oh wow. Wow, he's somebody that's quite professional in this business. And so I messaged him because he said I could always message him via Facebook and he would reply. and i did message him he mess he replied back in 5 minutes and said whenever you come back to london to kuala lumpur please let me know i'd like to take some photographs of you okay. and um about 6 months after i made plans to go back to kuala lumpur i did tell him days before and he said oh what okay what was your schedule like and uh-huh. uh, if you're free you come over to the studio mm-hmm. and i said okay and he gave me a date a time i was okay with that it was a convenient uh time when flew out to kuala lumpur went over to his uh studio yeah. as soon as i walked into the studio i knew this is where i need to be mm. i knew mm. i walked in and he had he had picture frames of the companies that he had worked with Yeah. Uh when I say companies I meant fashion magazines, fashion brands he had done work for and um he wanted this photograph of me because he said I told somebody about you. And I said okay. He took a photograph of me. He showed me afterwards. I personally didn't like the photo, but he liked it. And the next day he called me and said, "Are you free? Please, we want to take a photograph of you." And I said, "Really?" He said, "Yeah." I was excited. So, I went back again and I took the photograph. But when I walked in, I met he introduced me to some certain people and they had tons of clothes and a rack. And they had clothes and they said they wanted me to try me on this clothes and when to try me on that clothes. I was like, "This is weird. It's never happened to me before." Anyway, we tried this white suit on and i have a dark skin tone and it just kind of like just my skin tone just just kind of like just came out so vibrant so bright and they loved it 
and they took a photograph mm -hmm. and they were so happy with the photograph. The next month I was called and said, we want you to take a look at something. And I was at the cover page of a magazine in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia. That's and so that's how it all started. Again, I don't want to name names. Uh, yeah. A few years ago, a particular brand got into trouble mm. um, because of this. Um, going into Africa to, 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 to get brands to purchase, uh, sorry, to purchase fabrics and selling them on the runway for a really, really ridiculous price. Mm. Um, and that particular fabric is so highly re renowned, rated in Africa, Nigeria. Yeah. And so a lot of Nigerians seen it on the runway and the cost of it. And the, the particular, you know, fashion creative director, um, not even knowing anything behind the fabric or the people or the region, like you stated, um, got a lot of people very upset. Uh, I, think we, I think I might know who you're, which brand you're referring to. I think you brand. might know, and I, I yeah. really don't want to go. Yeah, <laughs> no, we, 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 will not. Was, <laughs> we will not. But I, I, you know what? It's been happening for decades because I can still remember a good, nearly about twenty years ago, I think. I remember being in my home city, Nottingham, where I'm from, and there was a big story about a very big fashion brand then. It's more of a high, it was a high street brand that had gone through a big um, remarketing strategy and a big brand positioning, rebrand positioning um, on the high street. And they um, upped their prices. They really changed their strategy. We've gone into the 2000s, so into the new millennia. And so they wanted to be a brand that was fit for the new millennia. Perfectly fine. Only problem was they brought out a range of footwear and on the designs on the front of some of the shoes, they just thought it was a really nice design. The actual, um, some of the designers who had been working on these designs had ripped this image, what they thought was just some nice bit of swirls, was from the Quran. <laughs> Oh. Why? Why would you do that? Just why would you do that and make it into a gold-like brooch and put that on shoes? Bearing in mind, shoes in the Middle East in Arab is an insult. Somebody takes off their shoe and throws it at you. That that is not a good thing. So it's again the cultural sensitivity. And you think, who was in the room when they were making, well, clearly we weren't in the room when they were making these business decisions. There was nobody Arab or Muslim in the room when they were making those business decisions because they would have said, guys, this won't fly. This won't fly. But it went through all those gates. And I think that's what I'm trying to get across to our listeners, that a brand strategist, it isn't just about being, say, a very nice stylist and having nice lunches. It is so much more socio-economic, political. Absolutely, absolutely. These are the same things that we need to look into. Yeah. And what I do advise brands today that I deal with, they're trying to get into certain markets is they also need to be socially responsible. Yeah. Uh, by creating, uh, uh, if, it's, if, it's, if, it's, if it's a school or something, to help the local people that they're trying to 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 they're trying to get their fabrics from, or they're trying to get into certain market, and I think that's why today um, I feel that Louis Vuitton has really ticked the box. Um, Louis Vuitton, did you say? Yeah, LV. Yeah, they've really ticked okay. the box because they have they're doing they have advices and they're doing a lot towards socially giving back to the people, to a community, which is a key thing. Because if you give back to community, you're not only making them grow, but you're also making them realize that, you know what, this brand is valuable. It's valuable because it's here to meet, not just for profit making, but also 
to give back. It's also here to 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 help people. And this is a brand that people want to, you know, rely with, want to associate with. And so it's very important that association with a brand yeah. but also giving back, we, especially with a lot of big brands. And and that very much underpins the brand strategy in terms of there's your your yes your brand your marketing strategy and all that budget that you might spend on that. But people forget, like what you've just touched on, is at that local level, the after effect of the factory that you might have taken over and the production or the manufacturing that you're you're doing, are you working with the local artisans? But then how does that impact, like you said, with the community? What do the community think? Which also then impacts your value proposition. And people forget the value proposition is just as important because it's why you've got your heritage brands like your Chanel, your LMVH, or LVMH, sorry, Louis Vuitton, Moet, Hennessy, why you've got your Gucci's, why you've got your, your Dunhills, for example, because those heritage brands, they try to make sure that as they grow through the ages, they adapt their value propositioning, they adapt the market strategy, they adapt their brand strategy, they adapt the logo, they change their colors, they adapt to make it fit for the world that we're in or the world that's coming. Absolutely, and and that's why it comes to consistency, being consistent with the changes um, that happens. And I think that's a key thing of, you know, being in this business, I have seen a one person brand grow to a brand making millions of, of, of dollars. Um, I worked with a brand um, two years ago, actually during the COVID. And this brand is run by a woman who wanted to start bags, selling bags. She wanted to start producing, designing bags. Um, but she also wanted to have, because she also wanted to promote bags for but also helping um, black, um, local black people from Africa. Okay. And so she went over to Senegal and she wanted to, um, she loved the craftsmanship behind the bags that were made in Senegal. Mm -hmm. And so she went over there and she spent seven months in Senegal. When she told me of her plans to go to Senegal, and she said, is that the best move? I said, it is the best move I've heard. Yeah, and I think for me, when she started speaking to me about this, yeah. at first I was like, okay. Immediately she just said, I want to go to Senegal to learn from the locals. Mm-hmm. I was like, that's the best thing I, That's the best story I've heard. Yes. You've actually told me. Because for me, it's made me realize that she is, she is here to stay. Yeah. She wants to learn more. And so I never took her for granted at all. Um, she went over to Senegal, spent seven months. I followed her step by step on her plans, what she was doing. Um, and before that, she left her job. Um, she left her job and went over to Senegal. Today, I can tell you today, this lady who only started with $30 to her pocket, when she went to Senegal, she started at the $30 guess what she's worth today two years after she's worth two million dollars she's worth two million dollars a day she's worth two million because she did her work right but again she got people great advisors around her Mm. to help her to 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 move her towards that path yeah that's that's the part but again that journey didn't start with me yeah. Or with people who advised her, that journey started with her yeah. because she had done her homework. Yeah. She knew what she wanted to go and what she wanted to do. And so for us, we were only there to also push her to that right path. Mm-hmm. But she knew where she was going and where she she had problems or where she had doubts. We came in. Who's your style icon? Oh wow! Come forward. Oh really? I've yes. not had him as an answer before. Okay, Tom Ford. Yes. He um, has, he, saying he, that, though, he's, he's got a very debonair style. He has. Oh, yeah. Very, oh, yeah. very debonair style. 
I love his style, but not only that, it's the story behind him. Okay. I, I always, every time I like something, I always go and research on the story behind the person mm -hmm. or behind the brand. And that makes me even like them more. What would be one thing you would like to be remembered for and why? I would like to be remembered as someone who is very passionate um, and I would like to be remembered as someone who believes in helping people, um, helping people, helping, when I say helping people, I mean um, making people believe in themselves. I want people like that look like me okay. to believe in themselves and I want people to grow. And so I want to be remembered for someone who promotes um, promotes I want to be remembered as someone that promotes his culture but also his race okay. and also um believe that he can also he has done so much to to promote um diversity thank you so much this has been your month's rap and chat culture and conversation i want to say the biggest thank you i appreciate it Bado. thank you so much for having me i appreciate thank it